Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. And today, all the way from down under, I have a very special guest, my good friend, Dr. Greg Fitzgerald. Greg is uh, trained as an osteopath, naturopath, and a chiropractor, but he is grounded in the principles and practice as a hygienic physician. And he's a long-term friend and, and a physician associated with the National Health Association. So welcome, Greg. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you, Dr. Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I know it's been, it's, it's been so long. For a long time there, you were making the journeys to the conferences, and then COVID hit, and everything went into, uh, went into the blender, so to speak, you know. Uh, so I'm so happy to be here with you to have this little bit of time with you. Take us back to the time where, you know, early in your life where, you know, what were the what were the things that triggered like the aha moment and the uh, the thing that drove you to pursue, you know, the professional path that you did? What were the things that were a turn on for you back then at the beginning? I know you were teaching school. And then from that, you kind of made a move away from that into uh, natural health care. So uh, give the audience a little background on that if you can. Sure, Frank. Uh, I was teaching high school for seven years, teaching the subjects of English and history, and I became increasingly appalled at the level of fitness and health of the students I was teaching in high school. So I started getting very involved in uh, health, looking up different health practitioners and studying general health and then decided to pursue a completely different career. And I then um, went and uh, did a three-year course in naturopathy, uh, during which time I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Alec Burton, who was the Dean of Osteopathy at the time. And uh, I got increasingly interested in his thoughts and his philosophies. He was a very erudite man, as you know, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, high integrity, and he had a profound influence on me so that I also did a dual qualification after my naturopathy in chiropractic and osteopathy. And I uh, was very much influenced by Alec and he introduced me to the concept of natural hygiene. I was a voracious reader, I still am, and I got extremely involved <laughs> in the philosophy and the truth of the natural hygiene movement. Yeah, I, I, you know, because we have some people out here that uh, may be younger and newer, and we have, you know, now the National Health Association. And of course, one of the heydays now that's coming around, and you see a lot of medical people getting involved in what's called lifestyle medicine. And I always tell people long before lifestyle medicine, there was natural hygiene. So why don't you take a few moments and clarify for the audience what that really means to you? What, what is that fundamental approach? What is that mindset of natural hygiene? So we can use that as a jump off point. Basically, the saying health is achieved through healthful living encapsulates the, the entire philosophy of natural hygiene, that health is the normal and natural state of the human organism. Um, if we get sick, it's because we have introduced causes of sickness into our lives. So basically, natural hygiene is the study of life and the study of health, because the conditions of life are also the conditions of health. So it's the biology and the physiology of health and disease. And it's a study of these and its implementation on a day-to-day -day basis, which forms a, a magnificent and true philosophy. It's axiomatic. It doesn't need proving because the historical uh, facts are that we arrive because of the conditions of life and the conditions of life are also the conditions of health, the need for water, the need for air, the need for nourishing and appropriate food, activity, rest and sleep, sunshine, etc. 
And what's happened over the hundreds of years since uh, natural hygiene commenced its evolution with people like, you know, Graham and uh, Doctors Trawl and so on, many other doctors have picked out certain parts of natural hygiene, like exercise and nutrition, and they've honed on those and they've used those and said, yes, we have the answer. Well, the answer is not in one particular thing. You don't get healthy through pursuing one line of activity or nutrition or sleep or rest. It's a combination of all of them. And it's the approach of balance, which I love about natural hygiene. You know, the concept of innovation and toxemia is fundamental, which is the buildup of toxins in the tissues and fluids and uh, so forth of the body um, after based on innovation and exhaustion. And this is fundamental to hygiene. So we've got to look after ourselves, Frank, as you know, on a day to day basis, we become a do it yourself responsible machine for our own health. Well, you know, when we talk about health um, as a natural outcome of the normal functions of life, you know, based on our ability to appropriate the biological requirements that you mentioned very clearly, um, I think people still have so much confusion because it gets really lost in the undertow. I'd like you to speak to this point of cure versus care. Uh, let's talk about that because I think for most people, the, the mistake that's often made, as you well know, is they just associate health with the absence of symptoms. So if they have symptoms, they immediately assume something very devastating or negative about that natural expression sometimes of the body. So speak to that just a little bit so we can clarify this concept of cure versus care. And I think that'll be enlightening for our audience. Very early in the hygienic movement, Frank, as you're aware, um, Dr. Jennings just came upon the concept of orthopathy, which means right action. Um, ortho means correct and opathy means uh, deviation or illness. And he came upon this concept, which is axiomatic, that when we get ill or sick with symptoms, it is not an enemy to life. It is actually life adjusting to internal conditions in an appropriate way. Now, natural hygiene views sickness very differently than every other health modality. As you said, every other health modality views our symptoms as anathema to health, as an enemy to health. Hygienists don't do it with the same, we don't look at it from that perspective at all. We view our illness as reparatory in nature, defensive in nature. So our body is working as designed using any one of its 10 apertures to release substances. For example, many years ago, I had a phone call from a medical doctor, a friend of mine, who said to me, Greg, quickly, can you summarize the philosophical difference between what you do and believe and how I practice as a medical doctor using drugs and surgery? I said, that's pretty simple. How do you view someone who's vomiting? I asked him. He said, we give them an injection to stop it. I said, do you have a spatula? Do you pick the vomitus up and replace it back in their mouth? He said, that would be ridiculous. And I said, well, as equally ridiculous is to stop it. Because if you stop it, you're implying it should stay within the body. I said, so if you're going to stop it, surely you would put what has been evicted back in the body. He said, that's ridiculous. We view that as a disorder. I said, there's the first point of difference. Natural hygienists don't view symptoms as disorderly. We view them as quite orderly. And therefore, we care for the individual by appropriate use of the biological needs. For example, someone might be ill. They have no need at that time for food. So we care for that individual in a very different way than a medical doctor would. They would suppress their symptoms using the term cure, which is a very medical concept. We wouldn't cure the disease because disease can't be cured. We would care for the person and the body would implement its own methods to resume its normality. Yeah, I, and in a way, it even gets worse as a mindset, because if you think about 
all of us brought up in a more conventional way, not only are those symptoms valuable, especially in the acute sense as part of the body's ability to heal itself, fever and vomiting, as you described, maybe diarrhea if it had to get rid of something, but we're actually brought up to fear our own vitality. And I find that to be really reprehensible because it's created a mindset of fear around the natural expression of the body in its dance of promoting wellness. And so that really is very problematic. So then the person, when they have a symptom, not only do they not see it as part of the natural process of recovery, they've been brought up to fear it as something that is attacking them and somehow putting them in a position of danger when it may be the only thing that's helping them get well. And that really is a very reprehensible foundation that really comes from the medical mindset, so to speak. And it's very, very problematic. I'm here with Dr. Greg Fitzgerald. Uh, we're going to take just a few moments to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is only $35 per year for those living within the United States and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion, you'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the extraordinary annual conference of the National Health Association and diverse opportunities for plant exclusive NHA cruises and travel vacations to exotic destinations around the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. And I'm having a wonderful hygienic discussion with my good friend, Dr. Greg Fitzgerald from Australia, way out, way down under. And we're talking really about the principles of natural hygiene, which really is an approach to living and thinking that is nothing short of revolutionary when you think about how far we have deviated from the conditions of health and well-being. And it's kind of intriguing because when you think about it, what makes it even worse is that we have this mentality, and I, and I want you to address this too, that you know these simple approaches, these lifestyle factors that you mentioned, if we engage them, if we put them into our lives, surely they can help us prevent some problems. But somehow when we create some state of dis-ease or we deviate from a state of wellness, we feel somehow that we need some yeoman attacking intervention because those same principles are not enough. And one of the things I always loved about hygiene is that when we have conditions that promote health, when we deviate from health, we need the same conditions, except we need them more rigorously applied. So if you need rest to begin with, if you're sick, you need more rest. And so that, that very fundamental set of truths has gotten so lost in the, in the maze of bizarre medical you know, information and so um, I, th I think this is one of the, the really strong suits of, um, of what natural hygiene is all about. And now, of course, it's being embraced to some degree in lifestyle medicine, though I really wonder, even in lifestyle medicine, if the medics can truly understand the real foundation of hygiene. What do you think about that? You think they're really capable with their education to break through and, uh, and kind of unlearn some of the ways that they have been kind of educated to look at health and disease? Uh, good question, Frank. In my experience, 
medical doctors who have been trained to fear their symptoms, fear the symptoms of the patient. The inculcation and the indoctrination runs so deep, it almost becomes part of their DNA. And they have great difficulty in understanding that the human body is intelligently managed. It's an intelligent organism and it works in its own favor. It doesn't work against itself. You know, if we, under, if we believe that the human body is intelligently operated and intelligently designed, we must then accept that symptoms are also intelligently manifested, such as vomiting, diarrhea, fever, you know, um, pains and aches, anorexia, which is simply lack of appetite. All of these things are intelligently manifested. The medical profession, unfortunately, um, are schooled to try and suppress them. So as soon as someone manifests a symptom, they believe the body, the human body, is then out of control. They believe the human body is in control when it's healthy, but lost control when it's sick. This is not true. This is an error in their paradigm of health and disease, which has cost the lives of literally millions of people over the last couple of hundred years. And this is why I love natural hygiene. It's understanding that the human organism is self-developing, self-repairing and self-defending. It will do a job if we leave it alone and provide it with, with the conditions it needs in order to keep itself going day after day. Now, that's not to say we don't need some medical intervention at times. That would be churlish to say. But by and large, there are more people who suffer from too early an intervention than, <clears throat> than we would like. I see it every day in my clinic. People coming in who have suffered because their symptoms have been suppressed and it actually compounds the problem and builds in complications to the disease. So yes, I find it very hard to convince most doctors that their bodies are intelligently managed. Greg, one of the foundations that has always separated and set this organization apart, and many of the doctors that participate in it, is the entire process of therapeutic water-only fasting. And so I would love for you, because I know you have a, a decades of experience, and especially having trained and studied with one of the great icons of fasting, Alec Burton himself, um, have a unique experience of that. So can you speak to your experience with fasting, a little bit about fasting, what it really means, what's the foundation of it, and some of the cases and things that you have actually seen recover in your own practice or in your work studying with Dr. Burton uh, in terms of uh, water-only fasting? Yes, Frank. Um, well, there was one pivotal moment um, over 40 years ago um, where I was sitting in the clinic with Dr. Alec Burton. He, he allowed me to sit in and watch his consultations. And a lady came in with severe facial neuralgia. And she'd been put on many suppressive drugs to no avail. And she was very distressed. I can remember this as if it happened yesterday indeed. And Alex said to her after doing a few facial tests and so on, he said, I think you have a window of opportunity that we can reverse this pathology. And with that, she went away and I never saw her again for six weeks. Six weeks after that, he invited me to go to his residential clinic in Sydney, where the lady had spent six weeks undertaking a therapeutic water only fast. And I bumped into her in the corridor and I hardly recognized her because her face had regained its normal shape and she was 100% healthy. And I said to her, wow, you look terrific. What have you done? And she said, I've been on a three week water only fast and it completely resolved my issues of facial neuralgia. And that led me to really investigating this concept of water only fasting, which basically, when you think about it, what heals the body when you fast? When you don't eat and you get uh, total physiological rest, what actually heals the body? Is it the fast? Of course it's not the fast. The fast does nothing. 
Fasting is simply doing nothing intelligently. You're just resting and abstaining from eating. So what heals is the human body. So th this really highlights to the natural hygienist how powerful that the human body is in um, re regaining its health when left to its own inherent devices. So when, when we talk about fasting, and, and, and I want to highlight some things because right now, I don't know if this is true where you are, but in America, you've got these online fasting groups, right? And what happens is, you know, I'll go, I'll, I'll see these posts by people on these online fasting sites, and it'll say, I'm in the 30th day of my fast. I'm having some back pain. Anybody have any ideas? So, you know, you've got these people kind of doing these renegade long-term fasts. Speak to the idea of uh, the importance of some monitoring and, and the importance of, you know, doing this under the right conditions and what those conditions are. So people have a sense that, you know, you want, fasting can be very powerful, but it can put you into a condition of, uh, you know, un, unrest and, and ill state of affairs if, if it is not done properly and with proper hydration, rest and all of that. So speak to that if you can, please. Yeah, very true, Frank. We've found the same thing here in Australia. There are all these online fasting courses and these would be if they could be practitioners who do a you know, a, a three week reading course on, on fasting and then they go and try and fast people on phone or Zoom or uh, online. And it's quite dangerous, to be honest. You know, fasting is um, a, a specialized area. It, it's a very specialized area that requires experience and a knowledge of biology and physiology. And so people that go off and fast without proper supervision can get into trouble because the fast can um, raise certain things. When you fa you're fasting, as you know, the body can go through certain um, processes. Well, it does go through these adaptations. You know, we go through gluconeogenesis and then ketosis, and the body can manifest um, some cleansing, we call it. So you can actually maybe get sick while you're fasting, which is nothing to the hygienist to be concerned about in most of the occasions that happens. However, if the person is inexperienced, they can perceive these symptoms as anathema to their health, that the fasting has gone wrong or the fasting is now inappropriate and they may break the fast too early. Or we had one lady once who was fasted by someone online and she went out the back and she started hanging some washing out and she got, got dizzy and fell over and cracked her head. Um, this is dangerous. We have to have complete rest. We have to be in a, a situation where you're getting support and counselling and that people are looking after you and you, you're not alone um, because you can actually fall, you can get into trouble. Um, it is a, a a process where you need monitoring and supervision. And this is where the natural, um, the natural hygienists have been so successful because they have clinics like True North in California with Dr. Goldhammer, um, which is a wonderful clinic, you know, 70 beds. It's the largest establishment of its kind, I think, in history and where you're fully supervised and looked after. So I would caution people listening to this. They don't go off and listen to some would be if they could be expert. They get someone who has experience in natural hygiene, not using fasting as one little element in the curative system, looking upon fasting as a medico would look upon drugs. This is the incorrect view of hygiene, incorrect view of fasting. It has to be looked upon uh, very, very holistically. The approach to fast, the actual fast itself and the breaking of the fast all need to be supervised correctly. I'm here with uh, Dr. Greg Fitzgerald from uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, Greg um, is uh, really well trained as an osteopath, naturopath, and chiropractor with tremendous roots in natural hygiene as a natural hygienic physician. Greg, where can people find you? What's the uh, website location where they can get more information about what you do and, and get information that, that you're sharing with the public? Yes, Frank. Um, my website is www.healthforlife.com.au. And if people want to contact me directly, they can email me on greg at 
healthforlife.com.au and I will personally respond and send them some articles of mine that they might be interested in reading. Um, that would be my pleasure, Frank. And Greg, I, let's talk about this because I know Health for Life is your baby. It's kind of like the way that you personally practice now. And I gather from that practice that you try to integrate the typical things that you've learned, structural care, chiropractic, osteopathically, but with the principles of natural hygiene. So take me through how that practice works for you, what you actually do and how you interact with people that come to see you. Yes, well, I get to categories of patients, basically. I get people coming in who have musculoskeletal problems, bad, you know, sore neck, suboccipital pain, interscapular muscular tension, lower back problems, etc. cetera. Um, and I also get patients coming in who have uh, issues such as asthma and chronic migraine headaches and diabetes, type two, type one diabetes. I get patients coming in with all sorts of chronic diseases who aren't in need of a physical treatment, who are in need of a complete lifestyle reappraisal. So I've been blessed in my practice for the last 40 years in seeing a very wide range of patients. And one thing I've noticed is that the application of hygienic principles is just as relevant and just as successful in the treatment of people coming in with musculoskeletal injuries as it is in people with chronic metabolic diseases. For example, I will get patients coming in with long-standing neck pain, suboccipital neck pain, and radiating down in between the scapula, in between the shoulder blades. These patients are often um, seeing so many different practitioners, you know, chiros, physiotherapists, acupuncturists, um, so on and so forth. And all they seem to get is temporary relief because the person, the practitioner, unfortunately lacks a holistic view of the person's issues. I treat chronic neck pain and lower back pain as I would any chronic illness. If they do not address the causes of the problem, all we're doing, Frank, is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. So I try and educate these people in the true natural hygiene sense. I ask them questions because in the questions come the answers. Do you drink coffee? Do you drink tea? Do you go to bed at a reasonable time? Or, or do you go never go to bed the same day you get up? If you do have any suboccipital neck tension or interscapular tension, look at your caffeine habits. Coffee, tea, chocolate, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, all of these things are anxiogenic. They, in, they lead to anxiety. They tighten up the, the neck. They stimulate the nervous, the plexus of nerves in the upper back and neck. And that causes a lot of tension in the long run. So by getting off caffeine, they do themselves a great favor in alleviating much of that discomfort suboccipitally. And yet it's never said by any practitioner. In fact, they'll often give them a cup of coffee as they're waiting in the waiting room. And we would take them off that coffee. And very often the patients come in and say, Greg, I can't believe it. I've had this for 10 years. And in two weeks of coming off caffeine, I have got very little pain indeed. And I often see that I do myself out of business, Frank, because they don't need to come back and get any adjustments or any uh, physical treatments quite often. Another factor that I talk about to patients coming in with these musculoskeletal problems, they often think that exercise is their answer. So these people coming in to see me have had chronic low back, chronic upper back, chronic neck pain for years and years and years. And they're thinking that exercise is their answer. So they go out on the advice of some of these poorly informed practitioners, sadly to say, and they embark on these very intensive core building exercise routines. They don't get proper sleep. And one truism that I've learned is you can never build health on an exhausted nervous system, no matter what you do. And so I educate them to get some energy back. Don't exercise to get energy. Exercise only when you've got the energy. This is most important to understand. You know, I get people coming in that, 
are flogging their bodies with these stretching movements and these vigorous exercises. And they're already exhausted. And they're only waking up every day getting worse. And they told to go and exercise more. I say don't exercise. This is a hygienic precept. When you're exhausted, you do not exercise. And so when they get more rest, the muscles relax more. I've always said, when you're tired, you're tight. Remember those two words I tell my patients. When you get too tired, your muscles will get too tight. For a muscle to relax, it needs energy. So the best thing is to get more rest and sleep. Stop stimulating the body with caffeine and all of these stimulants. And then we see the body come in to playing its own game and getting improvements in the health of the person by doing less. Hygiene achieves its results, not by assistance, but more by desistance, by desisting and removing the causes of irritation in the human body. Uh, Greg, you know, one of the big tenets and one of the fundamental biological requirements is the issue of emotional poise. So we know that with structural things, there can many times be a very stressful and emotional component too. Do you integrate that into your practice? Do you do any stress response management kind of work with your people to uh, really, uh, you know, improve that emotional component, that emotional poise component? Very true, Frank, and it's a very critical part of my clinic. I have patients coming in regularly who I say need a checkup from the neck up and they need to work on their attitude. They need to work on their mind. They need to work on their ability to relax, take things more in their stride, to look at their emotional health. And so we do meditation, we do tapping, um, which is a wonderful uh, technique, a tool to use. It's not a cure. We don't use the word cure as we've discussed. Right. It just adds more care to the body. And we try to increase their parasympathetic response instead of their sympathetic. Everybody today, in, in my country at least, is running on their sympathetic nervous system. They're exhausted and don't know it. Well, and that's so true. That's often, true in the US too, for sure. No question about it. And so we try and educate people in, in the true hygienic sense that health comes through healthful living. It doesn't come through a good diet. It doesn't come through just exercise. It doesn't come through just rest and sleep. We need to have, like an orchestra needs its four sections. We need to have all of the sections of the orchestra playing harmoniously in order to manifest our best health. And so we do recommend people meditate to look at life with a different view. You know, it's not only changing our way of life, it's changing our view of life. Our view of life is as important as our way of life, and that is our mental approach to our health. I often ask patients who are very elderly, tell me, I'm, I'm willing to pay you for consulting me on this. I, I joke about it. I said, tell me, you're 95 years old. Why do you think you have lived to such a ripe old age? And I will interview them, literally, and ask them questions. And quite often the answer will be, you know what? One of the main things I, I think, Greg, and I'm no expert, they tell me, one of the main things is I don't worry too much about things I can't control. You know, and uh, uh, Mark Twain, the great author who wrote Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and many other books and was a great lecturer, in fact, a great speaker, a great orator. Mark Twain once said, I have been through some terrible things in my lifetime, some of which actually happened. <laughs> and this is the trouble with most people. We're, they're living these, these dramas in their lives every day. And we need to calm that down and have a different view of life, not just a different way of life. Right. And I think, I think it's important to realize, too, that, and I know you've talked about this and, and others, and, and Alec was a classic example of this, you know, embracing this way of living and giving ourselves the greatest opportunity to be well it allows us to perform at the highest level at any stage and age of our lives so that we can actually embrace and truly live life. And I know you're someone who does that. You really embrace life. You live it. Alec was one of those people. And I think uh, too many people don't understand that end game. It's not just about, you know, eliminating symptoms or, or battling disease. It's about getting to a place where you can appreciate the full dimension, the the, you know, the panorama of what life has to offer 
Uh, can you just speak to that? Because I know this is something that you uh, exemplify. It's been a very big part of your life. And I think our audience needs to really hear that because too often we get lost in just, you know, the rudiments of getting well and, you know, treatments. And the, instead of understanding that the goal is this incredible ability to perform and experience life without pain, with joy, with happiness, so that we can really understand and appreciate what life has to offer. Absolutely true, Frank. You know, life is to be enjoyed. It is to be lived. And too often I see people coming in who are absolutely neurotic about, should I eat an orange or an apple, Greg? I said, look, let's get real about this. Go and eat whatever fruit you like and go and suck the marrow out of life. Go and go for a walk and enjoy your children and grandchildren. Appreciate the trees swaying in the breeze. My goodness, life, as Jim Rohn, a great business philosopher, once said, life is brief at the longest. And too many people make, take too much time worrying about the minutia, the, the little things in life. Get real, get your health under control to the best of your ability. Eat appropriately, exercise appropriately, get rest and sleep appropriately. Apply all of those biological needs to the best of your ability appropriately and then get about the, the job of enjoying your life, using your health as a foundation for um, enjoying every single moment because we're a long time dead, Frank. <laughs> well, Greg, as we wind this up, uh, is there any final words or any information or any insight you'd like to leave our audience with before we break? I sure would, Frank, and I appreciate your interview. I first met you in 1988. You may not remember, I went over there uh, with my lovely wife, Dawn, to our first natural hygiene, or at that stage, the American Natural Hygiene Society's conference. Um, and, and we went over there and had an absolute blast. Met Dr. Kiki Sidwar and Philip Martin and Dr. Scott and your good self. And I sat in on that uh, meeting as a, a young, young man with hair in those days. And uh, I was absolutely, uh, absolutely wrapped. I couldn't believe it. I would recommend that everybody listening to this becomes a member of the NHA, the National Health Association, formerly the American Natural Hygiene Society, become a member. If you haven't yet become a virtual member of the upcoming conference at which your good self will be speaking, Frank, please become a virtual member. I know they've sold out now with face-to-face -face registrants, but they've got plenty of virtual memberships left. I'm going to be listening in. I wouldn't miss it for anything because I can't make it over there this year. I was banned for three years by your, um, by your government. Uh, and so they've lifted, the, um, they've lifted that uh, vaccination, vaccination mandate now, a bit late for me to get over there, but I was uh, invited by Mark Huberman to come over and speak. And I would love to do that one other year in future. But I would say to your listeners, become members of the NHA. Pursue study of natural hygiene, the basic principles of that. Um, look into the website on the National Health Association's website. It's a wonderful website. Become a member, become a virtual member of the upcoming conference and plug into the truths and the axiomatic truths of, of natural hygiene. Only one thing will happen. It will improve your life. Well, Greg, I can't thank you enough. I'm so grateful that you took this time to... Uh, share your time and information and wisdom with us. And I encourage our audience to follow Greg, to go to uh, his website. The information will be in the show notes. He's got so much to offer and so much that you can benefit by following him. And I want to thank our listeners, our audience, because without you, I couldn't do any of this. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're a part of this active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, our sponsor, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. 
Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.